Concerning Chief Pontiac Pontiac has been the subject of many writers, and his movement across the pages of history has been thoroughly documented. His influence among the Ottawas and other tribes of colonial days was tremendous. He was an outstanding leader and a gifted speaker, and was able to perform to good advantage in almost any setting. Francis Parkman was one of the earliest writers to cover thoroughly the activities of Pontiac, and his research and writings were extensive. Pontiac was born in 1720 near the present Fort Wayne, Indiana, on the Maumee River at the mouth of Agulhas, where the City of Defiance is now located. Pontiac and his Ottawas once paid homage to the French as being their friends and the French king as being their great father. Pontiac was concerned about the English settlers taking Indian lands and worked to get French help in his war against the colonists. Pontiac was killed at Cahokia, Illinois in April 1769 by a drunken Indian who had been bribed by a trader with a barrel of whiskey to do this act. A later evaluation of Pontiac's activities indicates his influence was of less importance than it had previously appeared. The first speech below is an allegorical presentation in which Pontiac was trying to inspire confidence in his plan for resistance by resorting to the mysterious and relating it to the action against the colonists. In the story he tells, the god advises the Indian brave to put less reliance upon trade goods and to resist in any way the influx of white settlers. The speech was made at a council at the River Ecors on April 27, 1763, before the siege, the siege of Detroit. A second speech will be read, which include, which is included in uh, which Pontiac makes in a boat face and requests more supplies and ammunition from the whites so that the Indians can secure food. And now that first speech, titled, You Must Lift the Hatchet Against Them. A Delaware Indian conceived an eager desire to learn wisdom from the master of life, but being ignorant where to find him, he had recourse to fasting, dreaming, and magical incantations. By these means it was revealed to him that, by moving forward in a straight, undeviating course, he would reach the abode of the Great Spirit. He told his purpose to no one, and having provided the equipments of a hunter, gun, powder horn, ammunition, and a kettle for preparing his food, he set out on his errand. For some time he journeyed on in high hope of con and confidence. On the evening of the eighth day he stopped by the side of a brook, at the edge of a meadow, where he began to make ready his evening meal, when looking up he saw three large openings in the woods before him, and three well-beaten paths which, in, which uh, entered them. He was much surprised, but his wonder increased when, after it had grown dark, the three paths were more cl clearly visible than ever. Remembering the important object of his journey, he could neither rest nor sleep, and Leaving his fire, he crossed the meadow and entered the largest of the three openings. He had advanced but a short distance into the forest when a bright flame sprang out of the ground before him and arrested his steps. In great amazement, he turned, uh, he turned back and entered the second path where the same wonderful phenomenon again encountered him, and now in terror and bewilderment, yet still resolved to pers persevere, he took the last of the three paths. On this he journeyed a whole day without interruption, when at length, emerging from the forest, he saw before him a vast mountain of dazzling whiteness. So precipitous was the ascent that the Indian thought it hopeless to go further, and looked around him in despair. At that moment he saw, seated at some distance above, the figure of a beautiful woman, arrayed in white, who arose as he looked upon her, and thus accosted him. How can you hope, encumbered as you are, to succeed in your dream, design. Go down to the foot of the mountain, throw away your gun, your ammunition, your provisions, and your clothing. Wash yourself in the stream which flows there, and you will then be prepared to stand before the master of life. The Indian obeyed and again began to ascend among the rocks, while the woman, <clears throat> seeing him still discouraged, laughed at his faintness of heart and told him that if he wished for success, he must climb by the aid of one hand and one foot only. After great toil and suffering, he at length found himself at the summit. 
The woman had disappeared, and he was left alone. A rich and beautiful plain, plain lay before him, and at a little distance he saw three great villages far superior to the squalid wigwams of the Delawares. As he approached the largest and stood hesitating whether he should enter, a man gregariously attired stepped forth and, taking him by the hand, welcomed him to the celestial abode. He then conducted him into the presence of the great spirit, where the Indian stood confounded at the unspeakable splendor which surrounded him. The great spirit bade him uh, to be seated, and uh, thus addressed him, I am the maker of heaven and earth, the trees, lakes, rivers, and all things else. I am the maker of mankind, and because I love you, <clears throat> you must do my will. The land on which you live I have made for you, and not for others. Why do you suffer the white men to dwell among you? My children, you have forgotten the customs and traditions of your forefathers. Why do you not clothe yourselves in skins as they did, and use the bows and arrows and the stone-pointed lances which they used? You have bought guns, knives, kettles, and blankets from the white men until you can no longer do without them. And what is worse, you have drunk the poisoned fire water, which turns you into fools. Fling all these things away, live as you, as your wise forefathers lived before you. And as for the, these English, these dogs dressed in red, who have come to rob you of your hunting grounds and drive away the game, you must lift the hatchet against them. Wipe them from the face of the earth, and then you will win my favor back again, and once more be happy and prosperous. The children of your great father, the king of France, are not like the English. Never forget that they are your brethren. They are very dear to me, for they love the red men and understand the true mode of worship. The speech continues at some length in which Pontiac passed on the idea of religion and morality which were intended to inspire the council members into action against the British. The word was to be passed to all villages uh, and, in, and the Indian brave was to have been the messenger. The second speech made by Pontiac was given at a meeting at Fort Detroit in August of 1765. The fortunes of the French and the Indians had completely changed, and Pontiac had made peace with the British. In his talk to the military representatives, he seeks relief for his people. During the progress of the talk, Pontiac presented several belts of wampum to, repre to a, the representative of the crown, emphasizing the points which he had made in his speech. In the first speech, Pontiac presents his case for opposition to the British through the allegory of the Indians' reliance upon the newfangled goods and equipment, but here he plainly asks for the guns and powder of which he had spoken lightly earlier. Crogan's journal in the Illinois Historical Collections shows a footnote stating that about 30 chiefs and 500 warriors attended this council. This was the last major transaction involving Pontiac and the English. The speech um, titled, Father Be Strong and Take Pity on Us, Your Children, as Our Former Father Did. Father, we have all smoked out of the pipe of peace. It's your children's pipe, and as the war is all over, and the great spirit and giver of light who has made the earth and everything therein has brought us all together this day for our mutual good to promote the good works of peace. I declare to all nations that I had settled my peace with you before I came here, and now deliver my pipe to be sent to Sir William Johnson, that he may know I have made peace, and taken the King of England for my father, in the presence of all the nations now assembled, and whenever any of those nations go to visit him, they may smoke out of it with him in peace. Father, we are obliged to you for lighting up our old council fire for us, and desiring us to return to it. But we are now settled on the Maumee River, <clears throat> not far from hence, and whenever you want us to, you will find us there ready to wait on you. The reason I chose to stay where we are now settled is that we love liquor, and did we live here as formerly, our people would be always drunk, which might occasion some quarrels between the soldiers and them. This, Father, is all the reason I have for not returning to our old settlements, and that we live so nigh this place that when we want to drink, we can easily come for it. Father, be strong and take pity on us, your children, as our former father did. Tis just the hunting season of your children. 
Our fathers, the French, formerly used to credit his children for powder and lead, us, lead to hunt with us. I request in behalf of all the nations present that you will speak to the traders now here to do the same. My father, once more I request you will take pity on us and tell your traders to give your children credit for a little powder and lead as the support of our families depends upon it. We have told you where we live, that whenever you want us and let us know it, we will come directly to you. Father, you stopped up the rum barrel when we came here till the business of this meeting was over. As it is now finished, we request you may open the barrel that your children may drink to be merry. <clears throat> that concludes the two um, orations that, that I have that um, are attributed to Chief Pontiac. Um, these are, are rare words indeed, and, it, and we're fortunate that any of this was, was indeed preserved um, as uh, the European uh, people who descended upon the Native Americans, whether they were French or English, pretty much decimated their culture. So um, I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, I'll be bringing you more um, orations of various Indians um, as, as time goes by. Thanks for stopping by and taking a listen.